Before I leave Jonastal this time, I had to take a chance. Take a walk across the wire, up the hill, up the mountains, into the woods. Because there's something I need to find. Well, later I'll tell you exactly what I hope that is. Well, I can't get there from this direction, so I'm going to go back to the forest, mountains and tunnels, and try going over. The remains of the compressor station, where you'd, where they would have all the compressors for the, for the air, for the drills, and they would funnel that air through pipes over on to the work sites on this side and that side of the mountain. Of course the compressors are long gone sitting in Russia somewhere. And I hope you're beginning to understand that when it comes to this area the important things are not what you can see that's what you can't see, because they have done a marvelous job of destroying and hiding everything. Sure, they don't have to hide these very much because they weren't finished. What they're hiding is in the military area in there, like the radio center, communication center 800. Huge, huge burst of water, man. All right, people were swimming in there, seen the pictures. Now it's all filled up, covered up, and there's a gardening center on top. And this was an important place, and there's a lot more like those. Now there are a lot of these pits here along the side of the rail, and I'm pretty sure there would have been machinery, sand, gravel, cement. And when this was exploded, blown up, it's probably one of the pieces that came from up here. Same as Lisa. Unfinished tunnels, lots and lots of labor, lots and lots of cement. And that's all they said she wrote. Now there's a lot of reasons I wanted you to come with me and I wanted to show you this place because there's so many things that doesn't make sense. You have the, all the tunnels down there. You have down here a little plateau where there would be a narrow gauge railway up here to the construction site outside the tunnel entrances and then you have this that I will now go into and find out because it just continues around the mountain I'll be surprised if I can actually get in anywhere here because if I could they probably would have blocked it off yeah, this is pretty much... Uh -huh. Yeah, this is where the party ends. I don't know if this was a collapsed tunnel. So it's into this mountainside that all the tunnels, some of the tunnels were dug. This is exactly the same as the Riese. Riese project, 28,000 workers, hundreds of thousands of tons of cement with a few half-finished hallways, a lot of stuff missing. And these tunnels are not even remotely as finished and prepared as the Riese tunnels. So you, you've, you've seen us inside them. Granted, the tunnels we were in were relatively small and there are some that are more built up and a little bit more elaborate, but not by much not even by half of the Lisa standards. So if you look at 26,000 people that was working here, not to mention, in addition to that, you had all the skilled workers and laborers. See these, see the plateau here? Wide enough for a couple of train tracks? Large hole, I don't stand.
And there's the far hillside. That's nicely green and overgrown. I am at this point in time 100% certain that there is a very large underground complex behind this mountain in the military testing grounds, proving grounds that's been there for a long time. I'm pretty sure they started building it before the war. I am certain it's there. And I don't have to listen to the witnesses, the testimony, all the people that have written about it, whether American officers or locals or workmen or craftsmen. I don't have to listen to them. I just have to look at the labor and the result of what we can see. You know there's more to this. Here, coming from in here. There's not, this is background radiation. <clears throat> what an unforgiving, open, barren place to dig anything into. And there's still remnants. Lots of support trains, lots of workers, lots of tunnels. There's no doubt about that. The two, uh, I'm in between the two mountain ridges where the tunnel systems are, with the supposed army headquarters down there. Now it ended. I'm just going to these clusters, and down there is the other one. And here in between, you can walk, which we will in a minute. When you then throw into the mix the nuclear aspect, the nuclear testing, Deep Nuss Lab, not far from here, and then the very, very active covering up that is taking place today. Like the bombs that was found two kilometers from here that magically disappeared were dug up in the middle of the night. There's no uranium in these mines, these hills, these mountains that I know of, or I've ever heard of, or no one else I've heard of. So we have unfinished tunnels, 26,000 laborers, uranium, radiation, nuclear testing, lots and lots of secrets, and an active cover-up by the government today. It is a strange place to build tunnels this high up overlooking the valley. Just in case if you ever had any doubt how high up we are and how beautiful this valley is. And I'm not even going to talk about how climbing this mountainside was. There's a reason why you didn't get it on camera. But I'm going on the other side. And I'm thinking it's going to be a bit of a walk. Underneath me are the tunnels. And this looks like a man-made dugout. There was two rings of security surrounding this construction site. Which is interesting since it was not near complete enough as far as we can tell for anything to have moved in here. Here ahead of me is the valley where Deepnut supposedly tested some of his tactical nuclear weapons. And it is deep within military territory. But I'll see how close I can get, just to get an idea. The whole valley is in a bowl, so it would be shielded, secure. The villages are all around here. But for a small tactical nuclear weapon or device to have been tested, is entirely plausible because they were fully well aware of the ramifications of radiation. Certainly they knew. And they took the precautions of testing these in a valley 
which makes perfect sense. Now it's just about finding the right direction. Now you can't see this, but ahead of me is the valley where the testing took place. And it's impossible to get there undetected. But this is the hillside and straight through in, in a line in a line from where I'm standing, you will get to the castle where Clavana saw the detonation. There's a fishbowl here and I'm on one of the hillsides. And I'll turn on the Geiger counter, see if it says anything. But let's see if I can find any old tree stumps or something. I can measure it against you would think being in a fishbowl the radiation would be caught by the walls however it has also been mentioned numerous times how much the German military have cleared off topsoil and everything else from here so and I'm about three kilometers away from the detonation site I get nothing here, which I sort of didn't expect. And uh, through the trees there, you can see the valley. We'll go to the castle, see it from the other side. But certainly, given the elevation of the castle, she would have seen it from where she was. And as you can tell, I have square kilometer after square kilometer of secure area, testing area now current military, then military. Unless I have a specific coordinate, it's impossible to find anything up here. I was looking for radiation and a view. The trees have gotten in the way of the view, at least from here. I will say there's one thing that's a little strange about this entire area. It is the GPS is constantly giving different directions. My direction uh, is, is constantly spinning and I am definitely not walking in the direction it's telling me. My compass says something different. The compass is giving me a proper reading, but the GPS has lost me ever since I got here, which is why it's very hard to find the coordinate I was looking for, because it keeps spinning me around. I'm sure both we and the Germans have technology that'll confuse satellite navigation. This certainly is doing it. But if you see this, I made my way out. It's a little bit, I guess you get the feeling when you get just about close enough to Area 51, but in there, in that valley, it's where they supposedly tested a tactical nuclear weapon, plutonium, otherwise. Huh? A little paperwork. We'll get in there one of these days. The valley is to the left of us here. For here you can clearly see the castle. To the left of here is the testing site beyond that hill. And you can clearly see there's a beautiful vantage point for Clara to see just about everything that would happen here. What makes this story credible is that behind me in the castle there was a young lady named Clara Werner. She witnessed this enormous explosion that lit up her room as if it was daylight. And the next day, many of the people around had nosebleeds and the SS doctors were extra busy. Now, what makes her extra interesting and credible is she's not just he said, she said. She's not just a person that we have heard of. She's an actual person. We've seen interviews with her. Her story didn't change. She was at an age where she was coherent and clear enough uh, she was a young girl, that she understood what she was seeing and how to describe it. Her story never changed throughout her life. We've seen her on television and heard her on the radio. She describes these details of this test, this weapons test, 
of enormous proportion and light in the middle of the night, and several other witnesses have then testified to what happened after that, and to me, I have less and less doubt that Deepna tested a nuclear device here. Not the Hiroshima-sized bomb, obviously, but a smaller tactical nuclear plutonium bomb. And after all, there are also experts in shape charges, so there are different ways of skinning a cat. And I think they found one here. And I think some of this technology made its way to America. And from what I'm hearing, it made its way to America before we tested our nuclear device. Which leaves us to think, maybe that's one of the reasons nobody wants to talk about what happened here. Because maybe this technology made it to America before we had ours ready. And that opens up a whole nother can of worms. So, what do we really have here in Thuringia? Well, a lot of German World War II weapons industry, Luftwaffe factories, and huge underground communication centers, an unknown amount of underground installations, and a huge amount of known underground installations and factories, even an ME-262 plant 40 kilometers away from here, Deepna's test reactor 10 kilometers away from the testing site across from the hills here. And the most fun part of it all, the officer who told Clara Werner about the test, told her to go to the tower that night. Well, he worked for the German Postal Service. Remember them? They had their own nuclear program. Von Aden worked with the Russians after the war and developed their nuclear bomb. The Russian scientists confirmed the validity of the German wartime bomb designs also. And of course, we had SS General Kamla in charge of it all and his chief designer, Fiebinger who, after the war, consulted the U.S. Army engineers in the U.S. on how to build underground missile launch pads. Oh well. And, of course, we have loads of eyewitnesses who testified on the wounded after the bomb test. And furthermore, eyewitnesses who testified to delivering materials to completed tunnel systems throughout the war. Now, what completed tunnel systems are they exactly? Because we still have to see them. And of course, the S3 project was in the center of it all. An area full of, well, what? This means the testing site is right there, beyond that hill. Down there is the closest thing to the strange anomalies I can get. There's, there's something very strange in the way, and there's a lot of military around here, including communication. And down there by the corner of the road, was what looked like a vehicle shelter. And here's another one. And they were probably dug by the Russians. Since they were here for quite a long time. And they had rockets stationed here as well. This is man-made. But since there's two, one behind the other, and I'm on top of the, well, I'm on top of the mountain really. I wonder what is here. There's no roads here. Of course, they could have been overgrown. But somewhere underneath me are the tunnels. Let's see what else is out here. Now, for a minute, there's something weird about this. Yes, there's tons of signs by the military today saying you can't go here and live ammunition and don't pick it up. There's no live ammunition here. Shooting range is far from here. But on this important construction project, underneath me is this super secret construction project. And I have crisscrossed the woods on top and there's nothing. I'm within two Speergebiets, one within the other, safety zones, security zones, bunkers. I see no pillars of barbed wire. I see no bunker. I see nothing. No cement, no rocks, no pebbles. They see absolutely no signs of anything. And this is where I say something this secure that had this many security zones, the absence of anything is strange. And as I said that, 
on top of this ridge I find rubble stones piled down here I mean if this would have been a good observation post that have of course been destroyed made by slabs of rock dug out of the mine below makes sense you build your fortifications on top with what you dig out of the mine Let us for a moment recap what we have learned so far, before I tell you why I really went over that hill. It ties together, I promise. After the German 6th Army defeat in Stalingrad, it became more and more urgent to develop weapons of a much higher yield and of mass destruction, and to keep production locations safe from Allied bombing. And now the priority of the German nuclear weapons program moved up the list as well. And given the information I have seen to date, I am certain that German scientists and army weapons technicians have tested a nuclear weapon during the time of World War II. Not the size of Hiroshima, but a nuclear weapon just the same. Something smaller, tactical, possibly a concept weapon that could then be enlarged and mass-produced, as indicated by French wartime documents. And even Hitler himself have alluded to such a weapon in several conversations with his allied leaders on the official record. And he was on several occasions briefed by General Kamra for hours to this effect, including a final long meeting just before the end. This meeting was mentioned by Dr. Goebbels expressing hope that Kamra would be successful and turn the tide of the war. Also, documents in both Soviet and French archives mention this test in exceptional detail, as Stalin was briefed on it. Also, the Allied surveillance footage of the actual test site shows a large bomb test, and the many eyewitnesses' testimony all bear out the case that a device was tested in March 3, 1945, and possibly a larger test had already taken place in 1944 October, as witnessed by pilot Hans Sensor. Sadly, as many of the locations key to this research, especially where the American Army showed up first, all the relevant documentation have disappeared, or the sites were and are actively being destroyed by German and Austrian authorities still to this day, or are classified or off-limits such as here in Jonastal. In 1945, several things stood in the way of the deployment of such a weapon, however. Number one was the delivery method. Certainly the V-2 rocket had improved its accuracy throughout the war, but it really should be seen as a testbed for something bigger. Certainly the American space program post-war benefited from this technology. But at the time, Von Braun had constructed the concept of the A-9 rocket, a much larger and one that could reach America. And when we look at the facilities in Peenemünde, they were clearly built for a larger rocket system than that of the V-2. But this new rocket needed to be built, and larger facilities were needed to be prepared and constructed for it. So it was either that method or a dumb bomb that could be delivered by a plane such as the GU-380, which also needed to be built in mass. Germany lacked a long-range bomber, and only a few had been built by the war's end. There was, of course, the Condor, which could make it to America, but not with a significant bomb load. There was also another option, the lift body. It was nothing new to German research, and Eugene Sanger had been working on a concept for a lift body and even a ramjet since 1935. And in 1941, smaller scale testing for this propulsion was done on the Silvervogel lift body. It needed a two mile launching ramp powered by several V2 rocket engines, but the design was actually sound, as many variations of it has flown since. But regardless of which delivery method was chosen, Tamla needed time to build them. 
and the German army and air force also needed tanks, planes, bullets, rifles, and fuel to keep the millions of Russians from advancing from the east and the millions of allies from landing in the west. So huge, secure underground facilities needed to be constructed in order to also produce the mainstream armaments needed to hold up the advance, especially of the Red Army. So hundreds of thousands of forced laborers were put to use and in record time constructed enormous underground facilities, both for the war production and for the special projects. Almost a thousand underground facilities were put in place by 1944, an amazing achievement at the time. But from the end of 1943, it was a desperate time for Germany. And in desperate times, one seeks desperate measures. And given what have so far been documented to have been produced in Germany during the war, it seems certain they had the technology and the nuclear material. Simply look at what the Russians found and took from Oranienburg. Six tons of metallic uranium, 300 tons of other nuclear materials. The Russian post-war reactor was made based on German designs and materials entirely. Now imagine what the Americans found, given that a potential deal might have been made, or what Kamla had time to hide if not. And before the Americans arrived at his reactor in Stad Ilm, Kurt Diebner left with all the key materials. So where did that go? Still, even if Kamla lacked the delivery method at the time of the war's end, there was also the gamble of how to use a nuclear weapon on Moscow, London, New York. Neither would win the war, and it seemed that deploying a tactical nuclear weapon killing a few thousand soldiers when millions of them were advancing on you will just piss them all off. And their friends will not stop coming at you. On the contrary, they will come for vengeance. So that must have seemed like a bad tactical plan at the time also. But it must, however, have seemed clear to those in the know of the Third Reich that the other side of the technological coin was now to develop a nuclear weapon or technologies and use these as bargaining chips to keep ranking members from the gallows post-war. Complementing Martin Bormann's decree as outlined in Strasbourg meeting with German industry in 1944, thus for them to preserve patents and assets outside of Germany, await the war's end, and then all focus should be made on further rebuilding of Germany in a new form. And afterwards, something one can honestly say, this happened, and with much the same people and industries in charge. Now the key locations, such as Project Riese, the S3 here in Jonasal, Bergkristall tunnels in Linz, Doha Mittelbau, where the V2 rockets were produced, had a few things in common. There were significant air force, rocket and jet production and nuclear research located close to each one of them or in them. And of course, General Kamla was in charge of all of them and naturally Fiebinger, his chief engineer, was there as well. And today all of them are shrouded in mystery and lacking proper documentation as to what actually took place in them. Two of them were claimed to be headquarters for Hitler although none of them looked in any which way like they would be built for that purpose. And they were built at a time where other more fitting locations were already complete and could easily have been converted for that purpose, places such as Amt 800 or the cement tunnels in Ebensee. The Bergkristall tunnels in Linz were full of high technology and producing jet planes, so not really suited to be shared with Hitler and that and Project Riese might be considered too close to an advancing Russian army. But there's something more. The cement tunnels was one of the largest tunnel systems built, and they have practically been preserved today because they belong to a factory that have kept them safe from vandalism. I visited them, and they give a clear indication of what was truly possible. And the size, they consist of miles and miles of tunnels that could easily been converted for headquarters for Hitler. Sadly, a vast amount of the underground tunnel systems have since been practically wiped from the map, and there might be more, 
And when you add up how, at the war's end, documents and scientists along with technology disappeared into the hands of the Americans and Russians, and then the subsequent false cover-up stories put out at that time, which have shaped historical perception ever since. So today, now that the last witnesses have mostly passed away, those few that actually survived in the first place, it is up to dedicated researchers and historians to honestly piece together the true picture of events. Now, if you include all of that into the equation, it becomes painfully evident that enormous constructions, locations, facilities can easily be lost to history and even physically disappear, as I have shown you. But given the recent discovery of forgotten tunnel systems in Poland this year earlier, I hope, as many others do, that many more such places could be found. Now, do remember again the huge cement tunnels. They were built in record time, and with half the number of forced laborers that of both Bergkristall, Riese, and the S3 had available at that time. Just to give you an idea of what was actually possible with less labor. So, should more not be here in Jonastal? Logic says yes. The cement works were originally planned as an underground headquarters for the Luftwaffe and a site for research and testing of the intercontinental A-9 America rocket. But this was moved away from cement before it even began. So what happened to it? Now hold that thought for a minute. And remember Kamla's key engineer when it came to construction underground facilities Karl Emil Fiebinger from Vienna had specialized in underground engineering, cable car lines, railway tunnels, construction statistics, mechanics, in short he was really smart. His firm carried out not only the architectural construction of these tunnels, but they also did the lighting, the water, the gas supply, even the railroad tracks they laid. And Fiebinger was in charge of the construction. In fact, he directly supervised the construction of the underground tunnel system in Ebensee, St. George, Bergkristall, Milk, Quartz, the V2 test site, and many, many more. And guess where else? Of course, right here in Jonastal. It would appear that wherever Kamla needed secret, large underground facilities constructed, here was Mr. Fiebinger. And in 1947, the United States forces in Austria offered him a job for the U.S. Army Engineering Corps. And he went to the Engineering Research and Development Lab at Fort Belvoir in Virginia, as part of Paperclip. By the way, this same base built a nuclear power plant right after. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Now, what else did Fiebinger do in the United States? He consulted for the War Department assisting the U.S. in constructing underground launch pads for intercontinental nuclear ballistic missiles. And where, I wonder, did he learn about such underground launch facilities? Germany didn't have any such things. Or did they? Now, I have heard from four different separate German historians who have spoken of and show me plans for vertical launch pads located here in the Jonastal area, as well as huge underground facilities that includes a nuclear power plant. Now, it was suggested post-war by Himmler's aide Werner Grothmann that at Jonastal they used existing tunnels or mines to hide new technology, and given the labor available here, this is entirely possible and within the capabilities of the labor and engineers available here. After the war, Fiebinger himself testified to having been ordered to build large horizontal tunnels here, and prisoners who survived spoke of six kilometer long tunnels that they had built. And that the known tunnels that we see have carried through to openings on the opposing side in the mountain slope in the testing area. I have seen LIDAR images of the whole area and I've been told where many of these underground facility entrances are, even though many of them have been destroyed. And that is why I went over the ridge to see if any of them were actually visible. I cannot show you these images. I was shown them. I do not have them. And even if I did, after what seems to happen here, I would not make them public yet. So I am going to try to help find these places so I can document them. And 
when there's enough evidence so that the powers that be cannot refute them, then we, or they, can present all the evidence if it is still to be found. I will, however, just say that at the point where my Gaga counter went off, yet when we all returned there was nothing to be found and we wrote it off as an anomaly, that location did have several fat arrows pointing to it on two of the separate maps I was shown. So if a large rocket construction and launch facility were moved here, it would explain this secrecy. It would explain why Fiebinger went to the U.S. consulting on construction of such facilities post-war. Now can you imagine vertical missile launch facility pads in 1945? Or even just the concept drawings or designs of such? And what would the missile be? V-2, A-9, others? American units found documents and notes of rockets manned by two pilots. And that is why I climbed the mountain, went over the hill and through the woods to see what I could find. Now I did find one more small open tunnel at the far end of the row, and one we could just about squeeze into. Cut. Uns kein Stress die andere Weg zu gehen. Anyway. So this, I think, is a great place to once again ask the key question that I want those of you who still doubt that there is more here to be found. With some 30,000 laborers working here, it is impossible that these simple tunnels are all they managed to build. They could be built with under a thousand laborers in less than a year, certainly. And if we compare this to the system we know of, such as Doha Mittelbau, the camp had a standing prison population of 12,000, with the total number of those who worked there, of course, higher over the time, matching that of Jonasthal. But at Doha, they managed to enlarge the system significantly and produce over a thousand rockets, as well as built V-1 rockets and jet frames. Yet here at Jonasthal, with double the number of laborers worked here, living in several camps, they only managed to make these few tunnels. It just does not make sense. The numbers don't lie when compared to contemporary achievements. Now I know in Germany and Austria we don't like to talk about the war, and especially not what technology was developed during that time, despite its significance for future post-war. So many worlds first were developed during the time of World War II. And the circumstances were of course tragic, and we must never ever forget the victims, nor must we forget the civilians who were killed or the soldiers who died fighting for their respective countries. But research and discovering the special technologies, advances, and research is seriously not going to glorify the events, as it is feared by some here. But answers as to what really happens need to be found. And why did so many people die working on projects and sites that we are not allowed to see or investigate? or soldiers killed to protect them. I no longer care why this is covered up or by whom. I want to know what they did here. And honestly and seriously, the families of the victims deserve to know why. It has been long enough. Everyone responsible or dead. It's been over 75 years. 
and historians must be given the right to search these locations and correct the historical narrative if it is wrong. Come back. Now last time we were here and inside the tunnels, we were speculating on why the walls were covered in soot, not really matching a regular explosion as would be expected just to collapse the tunnel entrances. Well since then I was at the nearby Remark ME262 plant, the one where they flew the jets off the mountains. Well the Russians eventually took that area and the tunnels, just like so many others here in Thuringia, and when they blew them up there, they used phosphorus, and the locals talked of how they burned for weeks. This leads me to believe that they did the same thing here. But by using a fiery burning chemical agent like that wouldn't really make much sense unless you really, really want to destroy all signs of, well, anything. Paint. paint. Huh? It is paint. paint. Yes. No, wait a minute. This could also be soot. Reminds me on the one movie. Where had the Frau Dunkelnock befallen? <laughs> but what is this shit? Oh, wow, yeah, wow. Some kind of light protection. But, do you think this was deliberate? I guess we could take a piece and then... This is just weird. I mean, this is not what you usually see. German wartime construction. It used to be really good and solid and 
this looks almost like a, a cheap fix. Or to figure out what's uh, already uh, fixed to come up and what's fresh. Do you know what else it is? It is a cheap and easy way to hide an entrance. Oh, if there's an entrance beyond one of these, it's not. No pickaxe. No. Nope. Oh. <laughs> now I have filed an ungodly amount of FOIA requests, and we will see what comes out of the various archives from around the world. The next step after that is to start with the lidar and the digging and the asking for permission to do so. Maybe. It is now time to leave Jonas Tal for now, and we need to go take a look at several other of the most important sites in the Kamla Saga, and of those special and secret weapons testing sites. For that, I've gone to Calais to visit the V2 and V3 sites, because they are also not as straightforward as we have always been told. I found some anomalies in these mainstream history sites that needs to be addressed. But even more important, I followed Kamla and his men in their own footsteps towards the end of the war, after his meeting with Hitler. After Kamla ordered the Pinamunda scientists surrender to the Americans, he did not wait for the Americans as well. He traveled east just like the president of the Skodewerke, the biggest weapons factory in Europe, and Kamla's partner, Wilhelm Voss. They both headed east towards Prague, just as the Russians were nearing the city. Why would these two wanted men take such a risk? That leads me to Czechoslovakia and the special research locations Kamla had there, as well as the sites for a special independent Kamla stop, and all within driving distance of Project Riese and Linz in Austria, and the locations of the war's most advanced and important research and underground factory in the Bergkristall tunnels, a place the Americans took yet ended almost fighting the Russians over. But Kamla went past Linz. He went to Prague. At a time when the Russians were surrounding the city, the residents rose and fought with German forces. He and Voss took that risk and Kamla disappeared after meeting with American forces in Pilsen shortly after. Kamla met with Emil Klein near Prague. Klein was the head of the SS Pioneer School outside the city, and after their meeting, Klein hid something, some of which was later found during the first secret mission of the Cold War, one that almost started a new war between the former allies. But Klein had more, and I followed his escape route that he and his SS men took out of Czechoslovakia. I will show you some of these sites and places and the hiding place used by Klein in 1945 and tell his story. We need to begin to take a look at what companies such as Siemens and ING were actually doing. And I actually did find something really interesting and rather sinister involving them. And what other universities were involved in wartime research? The University of Graz in Vienna? Universities with link to the military, just like the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, where Karl Diebner had his research in Gotov. Other universities set up researches in tunnels in Austria, Germany, and those we have found and crawled through, leading to many more new questions. Now remember, we've only just begun this journey and there is so much more you need to see before we can actually conclude anything. Many of you have written and asked me what happened to General Kamla and why we think the Americans took him. In an obscure economic report about the economics behind the developments and factories in Ebensee, Kamla was mentioned. In a statement taken in May, it was said that he was interrogated by the Americans in Gemünde, near Ebensee tunnels, as to what he was doing there. So here's the proof. He landed with the Americans. What happened to him after, we're still trying to find out. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebner's nuclear reactor. Over there is the Machinot Line and all its amazing forts. 
I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow, and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.